Sphere 2 Project Origin is a first-person shooter horror game developed by Monolith Productions and published by Warner Bros. Games for PC, PS3, and Xbox 360 in 2009. This game serves as a direct sequel to 2005's Fear and was released after an awkward transitory period. In the middle of the original Fear's development, which was to be published by Vivendi Universal Games, Monolith Studios was bought out by Warner Bros. So even though Monolith had changed publishers, they had every intention of continuing the Fear franchise. The only issue being that Vivendi still retained the rights to the Fear name. And while Monolith was developing a proper sequel, Vivendi continued to produce Fear games. This led to two expansions using the same engine and characters from Fear, one called Extraction Point and the other named Perseus Mandate. These two expansions were developed by Timegate Studios and would be boxed into a collection called Fear Files in 2007. This collection, as well as the original Fear, would be ported to consoles in the intervening years without Monolith's f I fucking hate the name of that develop without Monolith's input. And they would later worry that, while certainly introducing a large number of people to the franchise, these expansions and ports might have turned many established fans of the original off with their new direction. Without the ability to name their sequel Fear 2, a contest was held called Name Your Fear to come up with a new name. The submissions were whittled down to three equally uninspired options. Dark Echo, Project Origin, and Dark Signal. I'm assuming because Project Origin is actually the only one that is in direct reference to Fear, it won the contest. This would be a fun publicity stunt, but ultimately pointless as Vivendi no longer had interest in holding on to the name after the lukewarm reaction to Fear Files, and sold the rights to Warner Bros. So now it's Fear 2, and because they already went through the bullshit of doing the contest, Fear 2 Project Origin, which seems I don't know, like a mix of redundant yet confusing because Project Origin was the thing you investigate in the first game. But now you're not investigating that, and it's Project Harbinger. So why not name it Fear 2 Project Harbinger? But also, like, Harbinger and Origin are somewhat synonymous with... Uh, introductions, but also this is the second one, so it's like naming it Part 2, The Beginning. I did not talk about these expansions in my video for Fear, um, because I'm not good at making videos. I'll try to briefly summarize Fear and its expansions, or the Vivendi timeline as it is sometimes referred to. There will be spoilers though, so this is a spoiler warning. If you would not like these games spoiled for you, uh, please do something else. Tell you what, why don't you go watch my video about fear? I'll put the link up right here once I figure out how to put up links. Alright, well, Fear ended on a cliffhanger, but it was one that didn't necessarily need resolution. Our nameless protagonist and Fear operative, referred to simply as the Point Man, has defeated the rogue psychic commander Paxton Fettel, severing his link with an army of clone soldiers. This occurs after numerous hints that Point Man and Paxton Fettel are in fact brothers, who both possess powerful psychic abilities inherited from their mother, Alma Wade, a woman who was essentially imprisoned and experimented on her whole life and submitted to all manner of terrible treatment enabled by her father Harlan Wade, and a weapons development company called Armacam. Despite being dead for years and sealed in a vault, Alma has managed to orchestrate an elaborate revenge plot through her psychic connection with Paxton Fettel and is ultimately freed by her guilt-ridden father. The Point Man attempts to prevent her escape by destroying the facility she was kept in, resulting in a massive, city-leveling explosion. The surviving members of Fear survey the damage of the explosion, wondering what had become of Alma until- Oh fuck, that bitch ain't dead! Oh god damn it, I spilled out my Cool Ranch Doritos! It could end there if it wanted to, I don't know what else there would be to say. We killed the bad guy, we learned about our past, several times, over and over again. I fucking get it! Alma got her revenge on her father and Armacam, and realistically tens of thousands of innocent civilians that had nothing to do with it. Extraction Point surprisingly just picks things up right after that cut to black. The impression I got was that Timegate Studios just wanted to repeat the successful formula of the original fear. And they went about doing this by sort of resetting and repeating themselves. After the helicopter crash, we pretty immediately find out that Paxton Fettel is alive again, and even he isn't quite sure how that's possible. They did kill off their de facto villain, so 
Yeah, I mean, it's not that crazy to bring him back. I mean, we, we, we gotta be fighting something. With not much to do in the wake of a citywide disaster, the surviving crew decide to meet up at the roof of a hospital where they will be extracted to safety. That's the main objective of this one. Make it to the place so you can leave. So once again, we have to fight through replica soldiers and Armacam security. Paxton starts hounding you again to realize who you are, your role in this. Even though, like, we figured that out in, like, the first 10 minutes of the first one dude if i could speak i would tell you that i get that i'm your brother despite being enjoyable uh, in that it is so similar to its predecessor i got this strong feeling of aimlessness and futility like nothing i do matters i think part of this can be attributed to the treatment of the game's characters the first one certainly had characters they were bordering on one dimensional but still kind of interesting the creators of fear files clearly have no idea what to do with these leftover characters so they just kind of smash them throughout several instances where you just kind of watch them die powerless to do anything Fuck, man! That dude is not gonna be in Rush Hour 3! Oh shit, buddy, you made it! That's not what you want. And you know, I guess it's a thing they did in the first one. Sort of deny your expectation by having a character you're supposed to save die. It happened with Aldous Bishop, it happened with Alice Wade. So I guess they just kind of kept that ball rolling, but I mean, sooner or later you gotta give this guy a win, right? We gotta save somebody. We gotta have one of these characters last long enough for us to care about them. Also, Norton Mapes, who was an asshole throughout the first game but ultimately dies trying to be helpful, is unceremoniously revealed to have survived a bullet to the chest and a nuclear explosion for... I don't, I don't know, the sake of a gag. It's fine that he's alive, I guess, but well, what's he doing here? What does this do for the story? Nothing. Nothing of consequence happens in this one. Some more people die, and the main character has moved to a different location. In the end, it's nice to play more of Fear, but it feels so much like an awkward, vestigial growth to the game's original ending. Perseus Mandate has many of the same issues, but does make a more concerted effort to distinguish itself. One of Point Man's objectives was to rescue an employee of Armacam named Aldous Bishop. While attempting to evacuate him, he is murdered by Armacam security. At this moment, the fear coordinator dispatches a second group to a secondary Armacam building to further investigate what they've been up to all these years. A different but equally unnamed and psychically skilled protagonist, referred to as Sergeant, leads this group. This was already a game that juggles a lot of factions. There's Fear, Delta, ATC, the Replicas. All these groups are essentially warring with each other in the streets, and instead of paring this down or simplifying things, Perseus Mandate kind of doubles down on this and adds a third enemy force with their own clandestine agenda to thwart. This group is called the Nightcrawlers, and they are an elite faction of mercenaries with advanced weaponry that are working for a man only referred to as Senator. After a lot of teasing, it is revealed that they are sent out to collect what they refer to as the Source, later explained to be DNA of Paxton Fettel, which can be used as a template to create more replica soldiers. The fight with these three factions makes its way across a handful of locations. The explosion at the origin facility caused by Point Man splits up your group. Once again, we watch one of your teammates be slowly and extravagantly crushed to bits. I think they make some half-hearted attempt at a sentimental moment by having his ghost appear in the final scene. Whoa, what do you want me to react to something? I don't know who the fuck you are. Think you're my dad? You're not my dad. My dad died in the fire, you son of a- You wish you never called. Only two dollars a call. Uh, we kill all the people. The Nightcrawlers get away with Fettel's DNA, Fear prevents them from getting Alma's DNA, and we get in a helicopter and fly away. That's it. That, that's the end. I feel like something sort of significant happened, and some new pieces of the puzzle show up, but they are weirdly shaped and I don't quite know where they fit. Altogether, they add some fun new mechanics. Not big things, just kind of streamlined things. I like that you can melee open doors now. That feels real nice. I like that they add NPCs that actually help you in fights. There's a pretty neat laser gun that they add that Fear 2 actually ends up copying. Both of these games feel really unsure about what they're doing. Like they are stalling, not wanting to commit to something substantial happening with it, but still wanting to capture the same magic, and neither do. They look the part, but lack the same charm. Lucky for us, Monolith does not acknowledge these games. They are non-canonical, and considered part of an alternate universe. So I suppose recounting them was a little unnecessary. But hey, now that we have an idea of how much the series languished outside its original developer's hands, we can marvel at what became of the series 
once back in the trusted care of Monolith Productions. Is ominous music playing? It should be ominous. Seeing as though the expansions are no longer canon, the last thing we see is Alma climbing aboard the Fear helicopter. The obvious move for the story, in my eyes, is to, are, would be two predictable but time-tested things. One would be to hard cut to weeks, months, maybe even years later, while we slowly learn about the fallout of this whole ordeal while facing a returning and all too familiar threat. You could also take the much more difficult route, which would be to attempt to pick up the game right where it left off. This could get complicated for a number of reasons. Either way, I would get the push for one of these ideas, and probably respect the majority of the choices made. I'm not the story man, I'm not a writer, I'm not... Damon Lindelof. <laughs> these would just be two things that, like, I'd get if the franchise did that. What monolith... What Monolith decided to go with what was the route that Perseus Mandate did. Let's move ourselves back in time with a different set of characters. Let's ignore the fate of Point Man and the rest of the Fear Team, while a near-identical cast, this time a group of Delta Force operatives, carry out the task of bringing the company's CEO into custody. This group comes complete with yet another voiceless, super-powered soldier with slow-motion reflexes as our protagonist, severely undercutting what seemed like a special, specific set of circumstances. For no conceivable reason, the creator saw fit to bestow this character with a name, which is Michael Beckett. You know what, it, it just hit me. I'm sorry, I don't mean to play my hand so soon, but fear isn't in this game. I mean the acronym, First Encounter Assault Recon, the group Point Man was a part of, your guiding voices, Jankowski, Jin, Betters, none of them. The namesake of this game is not part of this game anymore. Game is called Fear Project Origin and it doesn't have Fear or Project Origin in it. Isn't that just really super cool? We meet our new characters, one of which appears to be a relative of Jankowski from the Fear Team. Everyone is briefed on the situation and told that Aristed attempted to destroy the evidence of Armacam's myriad shady dealings and she is to be brought in alive. The team splits up and enters the building, quickly discovering that it is already under attack by a team of mercenaries hired by Armacam and led by a man named Colonel Vanek. It's implied that he is known to clean up the messes the company seems to make. As Beckett and crew fight their way to Aristed, he begins to have familiar hallucinations of Alma that mainly serve to bring new players up to speed on her background. Inside a secret compartment, Beckett finds notes and references to Project Harbinger, which he and the rest of his team have unknowingly been a part of. These notes indicate essentially that he is as psychically gifted, if not more, than Point Man and Paxton Fettel. Before we have a chance to detain Aristed, the explosion at the Origin facility happens again, causing Beckett to fall unconscious. And after an intense, semi-hallucinatory vision of being operated on, he awakes sometime later in an abandoned underground hospital, already under attack by more of Colonel Vanek's men. Beckett fights through these mercenaries while trying to link back up with his scattered team. It's around this time a character named Snakefist has got a different taste begins interfering with Delta Force's communications in an attempt to help them. He informs Beckett that the operation performed on him somehow enhanced the output of psychic energy he emits, making him a magnet to Alma. This ratchets up the appearances of Alma and other miscellaneous supernatural phenomena, which unlike the previous game, seem much more malicious and angrier. Fear 1 made me empathize a great deal with Alma, and given that we are playing as her son, her appearances were unsettling but sort of benevolent. In this one, Alma seems more physical and will latch on to Beckett and openly try to get at him. Once outside the hospital, the devastation of the explosion is made evident. Once again, the replica soldiers have been mysteriously reactivated, this time with even more Gundams. The surviving crew meet up at an elementary school owned by Armacam, where Snakefist and Aristed are hiding. This is where the main thrust of Fear 2's story comes to light, even though a lot of it was relegated to text documents you found an hour or two earlier. 
Ultimately, we learn a couple things about the reach of Armacam, the nature of their work, how they attempted to groom children to become psychic commanders that could control whole armies of clone soldiers, a process they sort of had working with Fettel but wanted to figure out how to do it sans Alma, and they hadn't really perfected even that before shopping these ideas around to interested parties. I guess a lot of my issues with this game's story is that it doesn't feel like a continuation of the game I just played. This doesn't seem like the next step. Tonally, conceptually, it feels wrong to me. I'd wager the majority of people who wanted to play Fear 2 were fans of Fear 1, but I get the impression that Warner Bros.'s clever attempt to pull in established fans while appease a completely contrasting and uninitiated demographic sort of backfired and ultimately didn't do either. Even though much of this game chronologically precedes Fear, it doesn't feel like any progress was made or that anything new was done. The whole plot is this bizarre lateral side quest that tries to repeat the beats of the first one, but bigger, darker, and dumber. I literally feel like we just left the real story and wandered off into fanfiction, where it just so happens another guy experiences the same set of circumstances the last one did, and stumbles on a whole new set of secret facilities we didn't know about until now. Add to that the fact that Alma is still central to this story, but her hand has already been played. We already know what she is. She no longer has an arc. Without that mystery, all the creators can think to do with her is abscond with subtlety and have her jump out and startle you every now and then. Also, we don't want this game to be associated with fear files, so we can't just bring back our antagonist, even though that was a pretty good idea. So we'll have this regular, unremarkable soldier man be the villain. Funnily enough, they did eventually decide to resurrect Paxton in a DLC adventure called Reborn, where a nameless replica soldier is tricked into letting Paxton take over his body. I would elaborate on it, but I refuse to pay money to play more of this game. And in one of my more nitpicky complaints that I don't expect a whole lot of agreeance with, I really think it was a mistake to remove all of the answering machine messages. I thought that was a well-executed and charming way of softly building the game's world. They were also kind of funny when contrasted with how dark the game was. Yeah, this is Chetna Counting. Uh, nobody seems to know what's going on, but we've been hearing a lot of loud noises. Have you guys heard anything over there? End of messages. There is something similar in this game, but they come in the form of Datanet Intel. Something that seems all at once futuristic yet antiquated. You pick up files and you read them. Uh, why they thought this would be more entertaining than listening to characters in context communicate with each other, I don't know. This highlights another thing that bothers me about the sequel. Fear 1 had this wonderful build-up where it felt really grounded and realistic but then became increasingly more sci-fi as things went on. I bought it because, well, Armacam is clearly a secretive advanced weapons developer and they are in panic mode and probably just throwing every half-thought-out experiment they had in the works at you. And because the world initially felt real, you got a sense of shock and awe when something otherworldly happened. This one immediately feels like it takes place a good 50 years later, aesthetically speaking. Fear 1 still had payphones and bulky laptops. It was clearly the year 2005. One of the first things you see in this game is a teammate affixing your heads-up display, which also reveals that this game takes place in an alternate timeline where Google Glass worked out and is a thing. Which is, fi which is fine, it's stupid, it's f it's, but it's fine. But it's like, how do we go from having your boss drop you off in an alley and you have a pistol to getting a fucking Call of Duty space visor and a machine gun. Why is, De why is Delta Squad more funded than Fear? Fear was a group specifically designed to tackle this exact situation. You wouldn't give them the Google Glass? You'd give it to these fuckers? They were support. They were support in the last one, and they all died. Immediately! Mission one, first minute, melted! But no, g give these guys the money. All right, fucking whatever. It's cool, it's all cool. It's not cool. It all seems like some elaborate and effective attempt to betray and unravel just about everything I enjoyed about the series. I don't like getting this hyperbolic. I don't like getting dramatic. And I'm not one to revel in my own disappointment. That's not what I set out to do. So I would like to begrudgingly commend Fear 2 for a couple plot details I thought were fun. I like the idea of facing off against the failed attempts at making psychic commanders. Seeing how horrendously the process could wind up was a neat idea to explore. I like that Alma ends up pitting one of your teammates against you out of jealousy for her infatuation with Beckett. 
The elementary school segment has some strong atmosphere, as it seems to be the longest break in traditional combat, and the game sort of revels in the inherent spookiness of its setting. I'm glad they began to phase out the heavy use of little girl Alma, and opted for wet and desiccated adult Alma. You know, because I already gotta deal with Paulette like 24-7, it's uh, every day, it's cholera this, consumption that. You know, so when I'm trying to relax, I don't- She heard me. She's doing some kind of passive-aggressive shit. Alright. Look, I have a million things I don't like about this story, but the worst part is that after two expansions and a sequel, I don't feel like I've seen a sequel to Fear. I feel like I played two enjoyable enough fan-made mods, and then a generic military shooter wearing Fear skin. Despite Monolith's distaste for the Vivendi timeline, so to speak, they really didn't do much more than them. We went back to the same time frame, we see the origin facility explode a third time, we see Alma's story in ghostly visions, once again we swapped leads, the lead realizes he has been unknowingly involved in the thing he is investigating, one of your teammates falls under your enemy's control, becoming a specter of sorts, the rest of your team is unceremoniously melted, an annoying but intelligent Armacam employee tries to help us, but is murdered in the process. It's the same. We're in the same place. The story has not moved past this one moment. It has just repeated everything with different characters. Am I an idiot? Am I not seeing it? Am I not seeing where this game is has an interesting story? Oh, really? So you're calling me an idiot? Get oh. Can't believe you said that. Look, those charges were dropped years ago, buddy. I think you're not going to get anywhere bringing up old, old, old stuff like that. Fear was a game that was near universally praised for its gameplay. It skillfully and satisfyingly simulates the chaos and strange beauty of an action-packed shootout. It made substantial leaps forward in enemy AI, in physics, weapon mechanics, it felt like you were going up against formidable opponents that were organized and reacted to your tactics. If you stay put too long, they will flank you or try to flush you out with a grenade. They will crawl under things, jump over railings, push objects over for cover, provide cover fire for their teammates advancing on you. It also felt really fucking good killing them. There is a brilliant sense of impact, and the way enemies are blown back by your weapons or melee attacks is transcendently entertaining. Your reflex ability allows you to pull off amusing chains of takedowns that make you feel heroic and strong. Or at least I'm guessing, it's not like I know what that feels like. I mean, look at me. I, I take that back. Do not look at me! You can also peek around corners and use your environments to your advantage. Get the drop on your enemies and just devastate a whole squad, or fail miserably and quickload to try again. It's also an atmospheric marvel in that it exists as an action game but can still provide me with legitimate scares. The enemies in fear would frequently startle and unnerve me. Sometimes I'd see a lone straggler from behind a corner and one-shot him. This would of course alert the rest of his team, who would then converge on their fallen soldier and the source of my gunshot, and I would just stay quiet waiting for one of them to get curious and around the corner. And sometimes this tactic would work and other times it wouldn't, and it was tense. It wasn't the most varied gameplay, but it was consistently entertaining, and a clear effort was made to keep combat engaging and difficult. I cannot overstate how much fun I had, and continue to have playing Fear. Fear 2 removes everything I just mentioned. All of that is gone, and if it's there, it's so diluted and boring, it might as well not be. If you go into Fear 2 trying to play it the same way you played Fear 1, you will quickly learn that that is incorrect. If you liked leaning around corners, quick saving, or walking, you will be disappointed. Everything feels clunky and sped up and not nearly as fluid and natural. Moreover, I don't feel powerful in this game. Even when I'm murdering hordes of black ops soldiers, it doesn't feel good. It doesn't feel rewarding. You are now allowed to, like the enemies, knock over tables and such to create cover, but the gameplay doesn't call for it. It doesn't really call for any tactic other than run in and shoot all the guys before they shoot you more. I didn't get a sense of any kind of intelligence from enemies. They mostly just stand and shoot at you or crouch and shoot at you. There is no opportunity for slow, tense shootouts. Because once you walk in a room, every enemy knows where you are, and the only thing left is to have a thoroughly deflated back and forth of bullets until you can walk to the next room. There is the facsimile of them organizing and reacting to you, but they aren't really. Also. 
all of your weapons feel really plastic and ineffective. I mean, you're still killing enemies, but it doesn't feel like the guns are doing what they're supposed to do. In my dreams, weapons are never effective and feel weightless, like a half-remembered approximation. That's what these are. Even your reflex mechanic, which they've already shown they know how to do, is not the same. It doesn't feel good anymore, and its function seems less like a display of skill or a superpower, and more like a make things easy for a couple seconds button, as not only will time slow down, but enemies will appear with a phosphorescent glow, making them easy to track down and target. The cooldown for this ability is also considerably shorter. It's confusing feel badass with make easy. It's a weird feeling not being afraid of your enemy. I never feel panicked or outgunned. How could you? They literally put you in a giant robot fitted with machine guns and missile launchers. This is the antithesis of fear. You are literally the safest and most equipped you could conceivably be. How could you possibly be concerned about anything? A ghost. I think this is the segment they chose to put in the game's demo, which is ultimately what kept me from playing the game for years. This is literally the opposite of what I liked about Fear. I liked Fear because it wasn't this. How could I care about this? I'm so disassociated, it just becomes a blur where suffering has no form or consequence. It's just a nebulous, cyclical impression of death. Some of the new enemies are kind of cool. I think the idea of remnants could have been explored more because it's plenty creepy, but you only encounter them three times. They appear as awkwardly reanimated dead bodies that are usually doing something odd completely out of muscle memory. Until they see you and then they run around resurrecting any dead bodies around and controlling them like puppet bodyguards. I like that. That's fun, and I didn't expect them to add anything that interesting, so it was one of the only times the game surprised me. I'm not trying to slovenly praise the original Fear because it does have its share of issues. In all honesty, both of these games function as corridor shooters. You move from area to area, shooting enemies, upgrading your health and reflexes, picking up health packs, and every once in a while that will stop and you can absorb some plot. The big difference is one of these is to this day a gold standard of programming, and the other is a substantial step backwards. It, in a way, it sadly shows how stagnated the progress of video games has been in the last decade. Studios don't have to be smart. They don't have to figure out new, innovative ways of increasing the quality of a single-player experience when dummies will buy a half-thought-out game that alternates between begging you for money and giving you the mild high of fake accomplishment. Oh, also, there was, of course, a multiplayer component that I'm not interested in knowing anything about. <laughs> Most reviews of this game, including ones that are harshly critical, will offer a gesture of consolation to Fear 2, that, hey, maybe the story, gameplay, and atmosphere are mediocre, but the game certainly looks better than its predecessor. As someone who is actively struggling to say anything kind about this game, I thought about this a lot, and found myself picking apart that sentiment. I can't deny Fear 2 has more detailed environments and textures, better lighting, whereas Fear 1 had this overly smooth, simplistic look found in other games like The Chronicles of Riddick, Escape from Butcher Bay, and Doom 3. This is mostly due to their specific use of a technique called normal mapping, where detailed textures with faked lighting effects were placed over low polygon models. This produced some quality visuals without hemorrhaging frame rates, but of course, substantial improvements have been made since. Fear 2 may look fancier, but it also distracts from those things with some really bad design choices. For starters, the overall look of the game down to clothing, weapons, and interface is inconsistent with the previous game, even though it is meant to occur simultaneous to it. Now, just about everything has some kind of glowing mechanism attached to it, be it a weapon's ammo readout, nearly every piece of your enemy's outfits, everything is glowing, people glow, bullets glow. Why is this a goddamn rave? Shit, I spelled all my Dr. Pep- This isn't what the world looked like. Everything seems really impractical. On top of that, there is a number of visual effects implemented to make the game look more cinematic, like film grain and head bobbing, that regardless of how effective they are, further differentiates it from the continuity it's supposed to be a part of. And look, I don't know how this video is gonna look once I upload it, because I've tried to render it like a billion times now, but I have to believe that these effects contribute to why every time I render it, it looks like the camera lens has had Vaseline smeared on it. These choices also deeply inform why I did not enjoy the gameplay as much. 
the ragdoll physics seem to have been heavily reined in. So enemies are unlikely to fly back from a shotgun blast, more like they just sort of slump over unceremoniously. Blood didn't look amazing in the original, but turned into a satisfying mist that blended into a pleasant array of particle effects, like sparks and dust and concrete. Fear 2's particle effects uh, in general seem so toned down that I barely remember there being any, and blood shoots out in strange sprays of vibrant strawberry jam that doesn't seem in keeping with the tone. It immediately brought to mind the game Nano Breaker, which is fine, but when I shoot people in a fear game, I want some semblance of reality. Otherwise, how am I going to get the intended rush of simulated murder? That ain't how folks bleed. And your weapons limply spurt out bullets with the intensity and kickback of an airsoft gun. I liked the way fear looked. I liked when games looked like that. It doesn't look like a migraine-inducing Technicolor fever dream. It's sort of practical and understated, but it looks and feels like a PC game. Fear 2 looks and feels like a console game, which wouldn't inherently be bad if it were not tied to a highly successful PC game. There are some intense visuals and hallucinations that let us get a polished look at the devastation Alma can carry out. It's just a shame it's not really in service to anything anymore. It's all sort of obligatory at this point because they chose to keep her as the franchise mascot, instead of having some new horror be released from the unraveling of Armacam's whole operation. But a lot of this does look really striking. I was sort of pleased when the visual of Alma on a swing proved to have some significance to her time locked up in Armacam's facility and wasn't just a contrived spooky image. Seeing her melt one of your teammates without artfully cutting away is certainly one of the more graphic things I've seen in a game. Were there truly stakes and characters to be concerned about, this would almost certainly be terrifying. Sound design is for sure responsible for a lot of the guns feeling limp. And in other areas is kind of serviceable, unnoteworthy. All of the voice acting is well done, but who cares who any of these people are or what they're saying. There is one moment of pretty solid banter in the opening, and the rest of the time, whatever they're saying is just white noise to me. The soundtrack is actually pretty good, and sees Fear 1's composer Nathan Grigg return. It's probably the only part of the game that genuinely attempts to recapture the tone of the original, so you'll see a lot of returning themes and sounds mixed in with some new experimentation. Because of the breakneck pacing of the game, the soundtrack needs to quickly cut between the moodier, atmospheric pieces and the exciting action tracks. Uh, th the notable exception to this soundtrack is a moment near the game's ending where you, in true modern shooter fashion, man a turret to hold off an invading enemy force. And look, I'm, I'm sure someone likes this. I'm sure to someone this was the best part. This was the game peaking, but for me, it, it truly cemented how much this game is just not for me. I don't get it. Whatever it thinks it's doing right now is only making me sad. Fear was a game that evolved shooters. It pushed the genre forward. It was far from perfect, but it was unique, well-realized, and an absolute joy to play. I get the impression that once Monolith began work on a sequel, all they had in mind was that they needed to catch up to the current landscape of shooters, which was releases like Call of Duty Modern Warfare 2, Halo 3, Killzone 2, Battlefield Bad Company. There was no shortage of these games, and it... people... Uh, people seem to like them. So for better or worse, I think they did do that. But by the time they did, the industry was already moving on and you needed more than a somewhat competent console shooter to stand out. That's really the heart of why I see this game as a failure, because it took something with niche appeal that did a handful of things really well and sort of failed at other things. Then the sequel's production focused on those failures and completely ignored what made the original a success. We may have removed the AI and gunplay, the two things we were unanimously praised for and even won awards for, but hey, at least you have iron sights and damage markers now. At least now an entirely different demographic might be appeased, after it's been stripped of things that appealed to PC gamers. You'd think they would look back on what people liked about their game, and if not improve them, at the very least, leave them there, as they were. 
Its success is that it is nearly as, if not entirely as forgettable as the games it is imitating. I'm looking at this Metacritic score, these reviews, Steam, and I'm baffled that there are so many people complacent with how average it is. But maybe that's just me being blinded by disappointment. In truth, maybe there is an enjoyable experience here that I'm too bitter to see. By all means, if you like shooting things and horror themes, I'm sure you could do a lot worse. This just had the perfect combination of not living up to my expectations, and ultimately not being the type of game I would even be interested in had its name not been Fear 2. I'm not a military shooter guy, and that's so desperately what this game wants to be. So that's it. I hate it. That's not something I usually express on this channel because I want to see the art and beauty in all games, but this one felt shameless and I don't think it deserves respect. You know, if you are a fan of this game, I'd just like to remind you that, you know, my opinion is worth nothing. There's nothing in my head that would validate my review on anything. There's nothing learned or educated going on up here. Nothing up there but dreams, anxieties, regrets, a looping gif of Kyle MacLachlan eating pie, and, you know, the usual uh, choir of uh, cacophonous screams, but, you know, nothing uh, of any worth. Would you stop? Like, I'm in the middle of something.